and how you build from an ethnography into a survey type instrument, with perhaps Likert, if, you, if that's the direction you want to go. Anything else that he said that you wondered about? He anticipated one of them by saying that the question should be distributed through the, through the questionnaire. Yeah. But I often receive questionnaires that, that, that go subject by subject. Uh -huh. uh, now, is, uh, is that always wrong or sometimes right? Or what? I don't know about always, but I would tend to go with the him because there's a tendency to bias the, the answer that you get. In other words, if you put questions that are very much alike, asking more or less the same thing together, people get kind of impatient, say, well, I answered that before, or, you know, and so they just, they get sloppy in their answers, and I think that if it comes after they've been thinking about something else, and then it comes up again, there's a tendency to treat it a little more, with a little more attention, would be my, my sense on that. I, can you think of a reason then why anybody would want to put similar items together in a life or span? Maybe a questionnaire would be something else, a regular questionnaire. I don't know how hard doing that myself. The only reason you might do it is that the purpose of the instrument is so clear that people know that you're trying to get information on how you like Hershey bars. So they're going to ask you a number of different questions on aspects of life and bushes. But normally a life and scale is not that blatant. Mm -hmm. So you're trying through subtle ways yeah. to get information on an issue without the subject necessarily knowing fully what that issue is. So that the answers are indeed unbiased. Or at least it's unbiased. And if they tend to remember how they answered the last time, mm -hmm. that might you know, push them to answer the same way. They want to consistent. When perhaps they really want to answer the opposite to that. Later on. Other questions? I also wonder about. Um, Grouping them with positive and negative statements. You know, like, what I hear him saying was, is you take a, a particular finding, you make, you state it in the positive, and you state it in the negative sort of thing, or you state it, state it always in the positive. How do you, how do you actually triangulate one finding with different statements? You <laughs> would say do both positive and negative. No. Yeah, because he said always, like if you start out positive, then everything needs to be positive. Otherwise, it gets confusing yeah, mm -hmm. if you switch back and forth. Yeah, I've taken ones like that that are very confusing. Mm -hmm. So when you when you're triangulating one particular finding, how are you saying it differently if you're not stating the opposite? Well, that that's a challenge. It depends on how simple the issue that you're getting at. But often you can find another way of getting at the same the same issue in the in a, in a language. Excuse me. Is this supposed to be like a data triangulation? A what? Just the data triangulating the data itself. Because I know there is methodological triangulation. Okay. When you're talking about a Likert scale, the instrument itself is not data. It's the instrument to gather the data. Okay. okay. But then you ask the question several different ways okay. in order to get answers, and hopefully the answers will run together. They will agree with each other, and that's how you triangulate the data that you gather on the instrument. Well, I didn't know you could triangulate it by asking the same question in various different ways. Uh, just let me give you an illustration if I can find it um, up here. Here's a couple of 
But here's an instrument that I put together in my research on intercultural competency. One question, one like the statement was, I expect to encounter many difficulties while living overseas. Another question in that same factor is I usually, I think of myself as a person who can do well working overseas. Okay, so I've got at the issue of two different ways, and generally I have three or four issues in one, you know, questions that got at the same thing, different ways. That, that's what he means by triangulation. Good. Anything else? So, yeah, I have a question then. How do you, how do you interpret the triangulation then? Your, your data. What does that tell you? Well, like if they pick two out of three, or you know, and positively here and negatively here, or I mean, how do you? You have to do statistical it? procedures. Mm -hmm see how well they run together. Okay, whether, whether, you may have four questions that you're trying to get at the same issue, and everybody answers three of them the same way, whether negatively or positively. But they, the, this fourth one, they tend to be, it tends to be aberrant. So they're not reading the same thing into it as you are. Okay, so you, you have to throw that item out, or that data out, because it's, it's not, it's not doing, it's not, they're not correlating, they're not running together. The data, you know, the numbers aren't running together. Yeah. yeah, that's, so that helps. And then, so I guess you're, you're, in, in taking that next step, you're, you're still looking to gain information about the conclusions that you've drawn to, as far as validation or further information, is that is that what a Likert will give you? The Likert will yes, it will it will help to validate the information you already have, but it will also help you to see whether that information is generalizable right. to the to the larger <coughs> population by doing the survey. Okay. And maybe to if it isn't in broader spectrum, who it is generalizable to? Like what group? Well, then you'd have to do it with another group to see if that's, you know, if you, if that's, you know, you, I'm yeah, sure. I, you know, I think I need to take my phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Camille had an interesting illustration. Tell them about the research that you read, the ethnographer, and how her survey was developed. Yeah, one of the two, art, two articles that I got for my comparison uh, was a lady who was doing an ethnography of a Christian women's um, action group or concern group. And she um, did a, developed a questionnaire and gave it out to over 700 people and then gathered her data. And then she went and actually sat in on a couple of sessions of this, this women's convention. And I was really surprised that she had that questionnaire built into her ethnography because we had talked so much about the fact that it's, it's different. Um, but she, it was, but her whole ethnography was very biased. She was not a Christian, and she went into this Christian women's group. And even as she described this the setting before she even um, talked about her findings, her her use of words and descriptions were were very um, very biased. And also, didn't you say her survey questions? Well, she didn't list the questions that she okay. asked, um, but she had picked a, um, a sample of certain neighborhoods where she thought these kinds of people would live. Mm -hmm. And so the people that answered the questions, she gave one sample question that just reinforced what her presupposition. So she built the survey out of her own head mm -hmm. rather than building it on a piece of descriptive. Because she did the survey first, yeah. and then she went and participated in the Okay, I have here a, um, some sample Likert papers, and I'm not going to spend very long on this, but I want you to know that Jim Decker has made himself very vulnerable. He, he brought me a Likert scale that he had put together, and that's the first one there, Decker's Checkers. <laughs> um, 
and said, you know, I didn't know anything about creating a lighter scale when I did this. And so I thought we could just quickly look at that. I, I only want to take a couple minutes on this. And then that other set of, of examples there are Likert items from the research I did on, on intercultural competency. I produced an intercultural competency scale for my dissertation. And what I did was pick out some of the softer Likert items that I have that could be critiqued. Okay. Um, so uh, if you want to just look at that for a minute, and then uh, I'm open to comments either on, on Jim's scale there or on my scale. What Jim was doing there in his Decker's Checkers is he had put together a game and he had a picture of the game. He had the game there for them to look at and then he wanted them to fill out the scale according to whether or not they found it, you know, the degree of appeal that this game had for them and that's how he was doing it there. And I only did the first two, because the only the first two questions were really Likert questions there. The appearance factors, um, high or low degree of appeal, um, and then the gaming factors, and he laid those out as well and had people circle the low or high degree of appeal. Any comments on that or thoughts about that? I don't know that he's going to do this again, but how would, how would you improve that? Um, actually, I, I thought he you know, did a pretty good job of it, but for not having ever had any help with life or scales. This is a very minor thing, but I would just in his first sentence there, rank the following features according to high five or low one. I would just flip flop those so those are consistent with the way it's laid out mm -hmm. on the scale yeah. itself. Yeah. That's, that's, and that's very important in life of scales mm -hmm. is to make it as simple and as clear as you possibly can. What about uh, full sentences? Would that be easy to understand I would have suggested that. Mm -hmm. You know, short, but mm -hmm. full sentences mm -hmm. so that you don't have to think what ways are you here. Or, uh, I wonder if the people doing the gaming, for instance, understand, do they already have experience? For instance, I'm not sure what multi-levels Yeah. yeah. And actually, I saw his picture. Okay. So that there were multi-levels to this game. It was like a three-dimensional chess game. I saw the picture there. And I, I don't know if he had them play it first or not. I doubt if he did, you know, because he had to tell them how long, down there on 2-5, how long it was going to be played. Uh, must the like uh, uh, five score one, two, three, four, five? Can it be just one and then two? You so it be force the person to make the decision. Uh -huh. Some that's called a forced choice, and it's different than a likert. A likert is a graduated from strong, strong, strong to, to to weaker response or intensity response. So always one, two, five. Always five. Well, you remember what Ted said? He said that, I mean, I've seen them up to 10. You know, haven't you filled out like your skills where you have to decide, now is that an eight or a nine? Oh, I don't know, I could go either way, you know, and you sit there. And what he said was that there's actually some pretty good evidence in the research that shows that five is probably the better way to go. When I first did my scale, I really struggled with a lot of people fill that N under, you know, that they're not sure. You know, and it's, it bugged me. I wanted to make them make a choice mm -hmm. one way or the other. But there are people, I mean, that's that's reality. There are people that just can't make up their minds. Mm -hmm. And and the end is important to have there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Ted says five is the best. You know, seven gets fuzzy, six gets, you know, then at six you've got no neutral mm -hmm. in the middle. Is this about spouses? What? Number six. No scale base. I think reading something into it. You're going to have to talk to Jim. I think anybody, it's, it's, uh, it's a chess, chess uh, term. 
Stalemate's one word. Any critiques on the second set, on uh, the intercultural competency scale there? responding to this game. Now that's, you know, that's still not the accurate thing that you're after, but, but just for sake of argument, let's go with that. Uh, if, if you were putting down an item like, I want to know if this game is attractive, um, is that a fuzzy, is, that, is there a way to say that that would be more precise? Um, Debbie's attractive, but so is us. Okay, but I'm, I'm looking, I'm using the term differently when I think about they as when I think about us. Okay, or that, that article of clothing is attractive, but so is that one. And I'm looking at them for very, I'm looking at them very, I'm using the word attractive in a very different way. So what, knowing intuitively what Jim is trying to get at here, what, um, how might I develop a sentence that would be more precise and make it possible for somebody to answer yes or no? What are the several aspects of a game that could be lumped into the general factor of attractive. Is it colorful? I like games that are multicolored. Okay, I like games that are multicolored. Um, be even more precise than that. I like games that are many colors. No. I like colors in games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you triangulated. <laughs> Games about colors. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a possibility that the attractiveness could be referring to maybe the challenging aspect of it? Right. See, so that's what we don't know because Jim is here. Yeah. And that's an example of the different ways you can use right. attractive. So, if, you know, for instance, we could say, I like a multicolored game board. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I say I like a multicolored game, Okay, that's, that's, you know, I can get away with that, but to make it as precise as possible, I like a multicolored game board, or a multicolored game board is uh, easier to uh, uh, play on. Yeah. And so it's, you use words like this, attractive, unique, Futuristic, just to have one word. I, I think we, it doesn't take a, we don't have to labor this, but I think you get the point yeah. about why a sentence, A, why a sentence is important, why a definite, specific sentence is important, and why perhaps you need multiple sentences. If, if for example, Jim wanted to stay with attractive as his factor, then he's going to need multiple sentences to define that factor. Mm -hmm. and what is it about attractive that I'm really trying to get at? So, um, what, what was, what were you saying again? Attractive um, is what? That it could be a challenge. Oh yeah, okay, mm -hmm. all right. Mm -hmm. The price, mm -hmm. the price might be attractive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he's going from low to high degree of appeal, which gets confusing yeah. when we're talking about attractive. No, I think I read into it all. He means attractive visually. Well, he has listed under appearance, which right. would yeah, be right. that's, that's true. true. That's true. true. Yeah, you're right. Right. So it's more precise than we thought. Yeah, you're right. 
Well, and isn't he asking for an evaluation of this game rather than, in general, this is what I like about games, too? Because, I mean, oh, yeah. you could say this this game is, is appealing, or I'd like to play this game, or... I don't know. Isn't that kind of the point of what he's doing? Yeah. yeah. But the fact that he's using it as a degree of appeal, as it, to the scale, rather than agree or disagree, or, you know, that changes what he's going to say there, too. Okay. So the game board is visually clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. uh, that's you know, still, it may not be 100% what we want, but the game board is visually clear, easy, clear. Understand why it's so important to pilot your life or your items? Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah, the game board's visually attractive or visually appealing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you still, you're not, uh, again, no quarrel with that yeah. precisely, but again, it's this game board is visually appealing. If I'm concerned about nuancing that, what does that mean when a person responds strongly and agree to that? Yeah. The, the game board is visually appealing. Strongly agree. Has that told you anything? General, general impression. Okay. Could you say uh, uh, a play checkers because the board, I'm using two, because the board is colorful? Can is somebody that, say that? Is that because of the game? Yeah, that's, that, that's why I'm asking if, if it's valid. It's a double item. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. we get the point. Well, any any thoughts on the, uh, the, the the next set? They're a little different. Strongly agree. Strongly disagree. Um, I'm looking for some criticisms because I picked out the ones that I felt were softer. Can you see ways in which they should be improved? Or could be? I think uh, the seldom is problematic. Uh -huh. Why do you think that? It's confusing? How would you repair that? Would you say I never do the same thing exactly the same way twice? It's very similar to using sometimes. Mm -hmm. The example mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I think just to remove it, mm -hmm. I do the same thing, the same way, twice. Okay, but that's not assertive enough, is it? Okay, and then I put it exactly back. We'd have to change the English a little bit. Yeah. I do the same thing exactly the same way each time, or something like that. Okay. Okay. <coughs> but you would be getting at something different than you would be getting at with this the way you stated it. Yeah. One of the problems is it's in, a, in a way it's negative and then mm -hmm. how do you go in the world mm -hmm. moving from negatives to positives. Mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes you can't avoid that. Sometimes you've got a purpose for doing that. But it, it, um, it's not <coughs> the best way to go if you can avoid it. What is the factor here you want to do? I seldom do the same thing exactly the same thing twice. The factor is what I call the venturesome factor. Inclined toward that which is novel and different. Mm -hmm. There again, you have on 16, you have a, a negative again there. I try not to remain in a strange social situation for long. How could I have worded that more positively and still get at the same issue? I 
always try to minimize my time in a strange social situation? Sure. You, you know, maybe this is just uh, psychologizing, but anytime you get an always and a never mm -hmm. in a life, it, I have trouble with that because who is always, always and who is right. never? <laughs> You know what's going to happen is you're not going to get anybody at the far end. So yeah. very few mm -hmm. people are going to take the strong man agree with the strong man because they're going to say, well, you know how you have your mother said to, to you all your life, don't ever say never, 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 never. <laughs> um, or uh, always. Yeah. So that is, and I think that's probably what I was struggling with was a long time ago when I did it, but I think that's what I was struggling with in the, the number one where I put seldom yeah. instead of never. Mm -hmm. for that. That reason I was afraid I'd get a bias toward, uh, against going to the extremes, and I wanted the extremes people to feel free to take the strongly disagree with strong people. Okay, well, any other thoughts on any of those? I'm not going to belabor this because we need to get onto our own. I wondered about the word strange, too. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I guess maybe I wouldn't know what that would be like for me, but would that translate? Would what I say is strange be the same kind of connotation you would, mm -hmm. or something else like that? Mm -hmm. But how, what, I don't know how to remedy it, though. I was trying to get at a, a place, a situation, a social situation where you're uncomfortable and you're not used to, it's not familiar. Mm -hmm. I suppose not familiar. I try not to remain in this. Some people would that would, would see strange as a synonym of weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or dangerous is what yeah. you think of. Thank mm -hmm. you. 